Good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, thank you for joining uh, the POCUS Certification Academy for today's POCUS Bytes webinar. Uh, my name is Daria and I'm the Global Learning Program Manager with POCUS Certification Academy. And I will be your webinar course today. So the webinar is now beginning. Uh, all lines have been muted. Please use the Q&A box uh, for any questions or the chat box for comments you have throughout the webinar. The presentation will include a PowerPoint presentation and time for Q&A um, at the end. Today's topic is ultrasound guided injections for musculoskeletal injuries. And our speaker is Dr. Mark Tan. Dr. Tan is a rehabilitation medicine specialist in the Philippines and actually the first Filipino to receive the POCUS MSK specialty certification from the academy. He has over six years of experience in the field of um, uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound procedures. And he's also one of our POCUS ambassadors in Philippines. And um, his main objectives as ambassadors to improve the accuracy of um, musculoskeletal injury diagnosis and to determine the best treatment with ultrasound use. Welcome, Dr. Ten. We're so excited to have you here with us today. Um, and thank you so much uh, for doing this presentation. Welcome. Hello, Daria. Thank you for the introduction. So uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be in the world. Uh, I'm Dr. Mark Tan. Today we have a special topic to discuss. This would be the ultrasound, the use of focus for MSK injuries. Okay, so... Before we, before we begin, uh, let me just share my, my slide with you. There. All right. So uh, why do we need to use the ultrasound for guidance when doing an MSK interventions? Number one is to improve the diagnosis uh, accuracy. And uh, number two is for procedure, precision, and safety. So we'll talk about uh, all of those in a few minutes. Okay, so first, first and foremost is to improve diagnosis and accuracy. Uh, one of the main waterloo in, in the field of musculoskeletal ultrasound is the liberal use of NSAIDs and uh, opioids to manage pain. Uh, sometimes we don't understand that the, that the pain is not coming from, from swelling, but rather from torn tendons, and we keep on, and we keep on using opioids and NSAIDs, and that that causes dependence for the patients. Uh, this is tied with the second uh, goal, which is to identify the true source of uh, symptoms. Uh, for example, for the shoulder, usually the, the, the knee-jerk reaction when we, when we talk about anterior shoulder pain or bicipital tenosynovitis would be to give NSAIDs or to inject steroids. However, uh, recent studies show that, uh, that the presence of uh, tenosynovitis already has already gives a high index of suspicion for shoulder tears. Uh, and the number three is to determine if interventional procedures are necessary. So this is where PRP, latent rich plasma and stem cell would come in, followed by prolotherapy and hyaluronic acid injections. So uh, this, three of these four can have an interplay where we mix uh, PRP to provide uh, growth factors, stem cell as the main uh, main component of the injection and hyaluronic acid as the scaffold for regenerative medicine. Another would be uh, the use of aspiration of effusion using ultrasound and lastly, the corticosteroid injections. So um, I hope everyone's still listening. We have a sample case for you. Uh, case number one is uh, pain and numbness of the sole of the foot. So a patient came in and and uh, told me about the pain scale of three to five over 10 over the sole of the foot. Uh, he, he described the sensations electric-like, and this is usually triggered by physical activity, no pain at all with uh, rest. Another caveat is he, he complained of a noticeable bump in the shin with, without any history of injury, okay? So what would the working impression be? I would like to, to hear about your opinion. So please answer in the Q&A box, uh, what would be your working impression? So let's, let's give everyone about 10 seconds.
Okay, we see uh we, we see answers uh coming in. Plantar neuroma, yes, that's that's a very very possible source of the pain. Okay, uh, tarsal tunnel syndrome. But uh, let's check. All right. So these are the focus images. So uh, with the with the patient's complaint, it was diffuse. There was a noticeable bump, but there was also pain on the on the leg. So I had to check the bump first. And this is an image of the anterior leg. So this is fascia in between, and you could see that the tibialis anterior is protruding into the fascia and into the fascia. So that's a muscle hernia of the tibialis anterior. And then also um, I had to check a bit more proximally because uh, the patient also complains of pain only when there's uh, activity. So we checked the ACL, the ACL is normal, the tibial nerve is normal in this area, the tibial nerve branches all the way down to the sole of the foot. But when we check the other component of the cruciate ligament, which, like, which is the PCL, we saw a torn posterior cruciate ligament. So this is actually a case of chronic exertional compartment syndrome, secondary to posterior cruciate ligament partial tear. So what happened here was the, the patient was uh, the patient was compensating by using the tibialis anterior as the main stabilizer of the need to prevent posterior translation and it compresses the tibial nerve. Of course, the patient did not mention in the history that there was a trauma to the to the front of the shin. So I had to ask him that. So imagine if we didn't use focus, we would have mi missed out the diagnosis, probably injected on the uh, tarsal tunnel or probably did a, a radio frequency ablation for the nerve, which would have been unnecessary. Now, uh, this is sample case, num sample case number two. Uh, patient came in with discomfort in the anterior knee. And then this is not associated with increased activity and only occurs with rest. Uh, important to take note though that the patients are F positive. Uh, I'd like to hear your opinion about the about the case also, please answer in the chat box uh, whether you think that this is A, osteoarthritis, B, patellofemoral pain syndrome, or C, infrapatellar fat pad syndrome. Okay, everyone's answering C, majority is answering B or C. Okay, when we, uh, when we take a look at the, at the focus images, this is a suprapatellar uh, recess, okay? And then this is the uh, medial, uh, this is the femoral trochlea. So what we could see is that the cartilage is even. So most probably this is not associated with the R, uh, RF positive arthritis. And there was no effusion with the suprapatellar recess. Now, uh, when we took a look at the medial meniscus, we see a tear, a slight tear in the meniscotibial, uh, meniscotibial ligament. However, usually this does not cause um, anterior, anterior knee pain. It could cause medial joint line uh, pain. And then when we took a look again at the, uh, the PCL, you could see that the PCL was, um, was uh, hypoechoic. That's the normal structure of the PCL, but there's an echogenic area, hyperechoic area in the middle. So that is also an anterior knee discomfort secondary to PCL partial tear. Again, the patient was, uh, was not able to disclose that there was a trauma to the shin that caused the injury. And that happened just uh, three weeks prior to the consult. Uh, and then there's also, of course, uh, with the diagnosis, menisco tibial ligament focal tear. So thank you for, for answering the polls. So again, this, uh, to improve diagnosis, and diagnosis accuracy, we have two cases, two completely different cases. And with the use of focus, we were able to identify that these are essentially similar cases of the posterior cruciate ligament. Um, and the uh, intervention would have been, um, would have been, would not have been successful if, uh, fo if focus was not done. So accurate diagnosis leads to better treatment plan. So the second part of the role of uh, focus for ultrasound guided MSK in injuries would be to improve the success rate deliver the injectate to the target location, and of course, prevent neurovascular injuries. Um, this slide would show us, this slide would show us the comparison between uh, the palpation or the traditional injections for MSK injuries and ultrasound guidance. So I, I know this is a, this is a very busy uh, slide, 
but uh, what we can what we can see here or what we can surmise here is that US guidance is way superior to palpation guided injections. Okay, and then for procedure, position, and safety, I'd like to show um, an area of the carpal tunnel. So this would be the median nerve at the center. Okay, and then this would be, somewhere here would be the radial artery. We have the ulnar artery with aliasing. Okay, so these are artifacts and then tendons. So this is how intricate the architecture of the carpal tunnel is. So when we use blind injections, there's a potential to injure any of the structures or even hit the nerve, which could cause further damage. So focus plays a huge role in, in providing safety for the patients. So uh, for the injection techniques and tips, um, we, have a poll question, we have a poll question for you. Question number one. Okay. So uh, poll, poll question number one, uh, uh, I believe it should be uh, shown in the screen right now. Yes, we have, what type of transducer is used in the injection? Okay, for a moment. So we have liner, phased area, footprint, or curved liner. And we have about 50% people who answered. So we'll give another five seconds. Thank you. And here are the results. Okay, so uh, I think majority got it right uh, with, the, with the transducer. Okay, so uh, very good. That's a linear linear transducer. So uh, the first, the second question would be uh, the our next our next topic would be the injection techniques and uh, tips. So first we have to talk about the needle approach. The first approach is the in plane approach. So the you see the needle in the long axis. So I pre I prepared a video for you to see the trajectory of the needle. So the needle should look like this. Okay, so that's the in-plane approach. So you see the entire uh, tip and the shaft of the needle. Now, uh, another approach would be the out-of-plane approach. Okay. <clears throat> so for the out-of-plane approach, you would only see the tip of the needle. So it's somewhere near the spin. Um, it's in short axis view. So you'd see the needle jab, jab in the screen for a couple of times here. There. So that's the out-of-plane approach. So there's a huge difference. So uh, the difference between the in-plane and the out-of-plane approach, out-of-plane is uh, more tolerable because there's a, short, a shorter needle trajectory as compared to in-plane approach. However, in-plane approach would uh, help us visualize the entire shaft and more importantly, the tip of the needle. Because sometimes we see what we see on the out-of-plane approach is not the tip, but the shaft of the, of the needle. And that's an issue because the tip can puncture uh, neurovascular structures. So essentially out of plane is a more advanced uh, approach for, for injections. So uh, I'd like to share some tips with you regarding the injection, with, regarding performance of ultrasound uh, injections. Number one is that the needle should be perpendicular to the ultrasound beam and always look first, look first at the trajectory of the needle when you inject, you will not be able to see the needle right away in the monitor, unless you can see that the needle is directly underneath the, the transducer. So, so that's a very important uh, pitfall. So look at me here, I'm looking, I'm looking immediately, I'm looking immediately at the screen after injecting. And on the first image, you could see that the needle here, it's not oriented properly. Um, it's, not, it's not directly under the, the sound beam. Sound beam's only one millimeter away. So if the needle deviates at, at this angle, you will not be able to see 
the needle. So you're essentially pr- performing a blind injection. Another thing that could occur is that the needle steady, but the transducer slides. So it's always important to aim at the center. So this is the marker usually for, for transducers. Aim here at the center when we are injecting. Make sure that the needle is straight so we avoid this common uh, pitfall. And the number two, uh, injection tip number two would be to use toggling or heel toe transducer mo- motion to search for the needle. One of the, one of the difficulties in learning ultrasound guidance is usually when we don't see the needle, we try to move both the transducer and the needle. You will never be able to search the, the needle that way. So um, this is how we use the toggling, the heel toe, this is the heel toe motion. Okay, that's a bit fast. We have to do it very gently, about uh, a millimeter per second only. And then this is the the other other technique, which is a toggling method. And then injection number three is use the appropriate needle length and uh, use an echogenic needle for deep injections. So this is a comparison between two sacroiliac joint uh, injections. So you can see here that this is the ilium. This would be part of the sacrum. Uh, this is the needle shaft and tip for a non-echogenic needle. And this is the shaft and tip for the echogenic needle. So you could see the, the difference between the two. So if, if you have the opportunity to use uh, echogenic needles, please use them. It would, uh, it would make the procedure more comfortable for the patient because you don't need to keep on searching for the needle tip. Uh, another thing is the use of appropriate needle length. Sometimes uh, we, we're used to doing injections using one, one inch needles. Usually the, the one inch needles are not sufficient for ultrasound guided injections because we try to, we try to keep the beam, we, we try to keep the needle as perpendicular to the sound beam as, as possible. So usually if one, needle, one inch needles are short. Uh, injection tip number four is to use the markers, use the markers as the gauge for needle entry depth. So this is in particular when we're injecting curved structures such as the such as the knee. So you could see that the markers here uh, in in our machine in the clinic, this would denote one one centimeter, one centimeter, two centimeters, three centimeters. I usually use my pinky to guide uh, to to gauge one centimeter. Uh, that would be a rough estimate. So, so that when you need to enter the plane or the field of view in, a, in an almost parallel manner, you'd be able to hit it without a lot of, con- well, not, without a lot of inconvenience for the patients. And then uh, now we're, we're going to the, to the main topic, which is ultrasound guided injections for musculoskeletal injuries. So I prepared uh, videos. Uh, these videos are actually my own videos from the clinic. Uh, I'd like to show you these videos and share them with you to see how ultrasound is being used for various MSK injuries. So this one's for the AC joint. This is an out of plane approach, uh, but for the video, I, I'm using an in plane ap- approach. So we're entering here uh, under the transducer. Okay, so this is the video. How did it look? There's a needle. We have the needle and it's puncturing the, the capsule first. Then we also uh, inject superior to the ligaments, also to fortify the ligaments. This is a regenerative procedure. This is not a, a steroid procedure. So uh, an important disclaimer, what you see in, major- in all of my videos right now, except for the aspiration, would be uh, regenerative procedures. So we, do not, we, we are able to inject directly into the soft tissue. Uh, it's important to note that we cannot inject steroids directly into cartilage because that can cause a further breakdown of the cartilage uh, as well. Now, uh, this is another uh, injection for the rotator interval. For the rotator interval, usually the hands internally rotated and we have the transducer here. Uh, always have the patient lie down when you're injecting. This is an uncomfortable proce- procedure, so we don't want the risk of uh, vasovagal re- responses after the injection, which causes the fainting. So my entry point would be here from this area. That's going to be my entry point from lateral going to medial. So we see the needle here. This is a biceps tendon. We're entering the supraspinatus. 
And uh, another thing to, to note here is uh, I'm using Doppler. I'm using color imaging. So that guides with the needle flow. And if you could see also, I'll pause again. You could see that the bevel is facing down. This is very important for when doing injections. So if you inject with the bevel facing up, the, the inject tape will not go to the, to the area where there's injury, but it will go superiorly and possibly leak into the subacromial subdeltoid bursa. That's something we don't want with the regenerative procedures because that can, co that can cause uh, transient pains also secondary to iatrogenic bursitis. So it's important to make sure that the needle is facing bevel down if the injury is uh, a bit more inferior. So for deeper injections, usually, um, usually we have to, particularly for the shoulder, we have to inject with the bevel facing down. And then here we could see in real time the color flow of the of the injection of the inject tape going into the tendons, uh, and this, this also helps identify needle motion. And lastly, um, with this with this video also, I'd like to share something else. You can see that there are reverberation artifacts except for the tip. So that's where you identify the tip. And the tip is something that we have to see at all times because usually this is the one that cuts through tissues. So the, there's rever reverberation artifacts here. The, these are the white lines under the shaft, but you can't see that one with the tip. That's a very important uh, part when, when doing ultrasound guided injections. Now the, uh, for the linear labrum, we have the patient side lying I, uh, to the side, to the side um, opposite the side where we will do the injection. Um, <clears throat> linear can be used for patients with, uh, with, uh, with small frame, but for larger frame individuals, usually I use a curvilinear injection. Okay, so now um, we'll do the injection here. So we'll do the injection so you can see that I'm using an echo gen needle again. There's a lesion in the glenoid labrum, so I'm going to inject in the labrum first. Okay, so if you're going to inject here at the glenohumeral joint, it has to be in between the labrum and the humeral head. So that's how we inject. So this is the second part. I'm injecting in the glenohumeral joint right now. And then we pull out the needle. Another common uh, injury would be tennis elbow. So with, with tennis elbow injections, usually we just inject uh, in plane uh, with the elbow bent at around about 45 degrees. And then you could see the needle coming in. Again, this is the importance of using longer needles. You might not be able to reach this area if you're using a very short needle. So it's important to inject the, the proximal part as well, these types of injection. You can see the here. Uh, you can see the the injectate going. Uh, again, the the videos are have a faster speed than normal. So that's not how I. That's not how fast I do my injections. It's going to be too uncomfortable for the patient, and we have to to also understand that the muscle is a bit gamey when they're injecting. So uh, there might be some resistance when they're injecting. Um, again, always remember also to look at the patient when when we're injecting. Sometimes you're so fixated on the screen that uh, we can't see the patient is already in a lot of pain. So uh, in the field of pain management, that would be unacceptable. So slowly advance the needle as long as you can see without causing a lot of discomfort for the patient. All right, and now this is an injection for the TFCC. Uh, I don't have the photo here. I, I was not able to secure the, the consent from the patient on injection of the TFCC, but normally this is how we do it. With the palm facing down uh, in a towel, okay? Uh, we put the transducer here and then we inject from proximal to, to distal. So this is how it would look like. Again, we would like to inject as a lot of areas as possible. I'm using the color flow again. You'd see that this is the hypoechoic area. That's where the interstitial tears are for the TFCC. This would be the meniscus homologue. So we don't want to inject here, but rather inject here. And then we do fenestration and injecting. I'm also inject, injecting PRP as I withdraw the needle um, to refortify the ligaments and also the extensor carpi ulnaris. So you can do that when withdrawing to accelerate the healing on areas that you may have, uh, have to traverse 
to do an injection. Now, for the sacroiliac joint, usually we lie prone, and it's important to identify this structure. This is the ilium, so you can see the heavy uh, shadowing here. So bone, bone would reflect all the sound beam uh, back all the way to uh, superiorly to the to the transducer, and this would be the sacrum part of the sacrum. This is a sacral foramina, so be careful not to inject here. We could trigger uh, nerve, nerve injuries. So what we're trying to inject here would be number one, the sacroiliac ligament and the sacrotuberous, the dorsal sacroiliac ligament and the sacrotuberous ligament. So uh, we're injecting using an echogenic needle again. Um, again, this is a difficult injection. So if you could use echogenic needles, that would be better. And then uh, we try to move the, the needle to different segments. Uh, this is the, the longissimus muscle. So the injection, you'd feel some resistance before you're able to reach the ligament. And once you, once you reach the ligament, that's going to be a, another, uh, another point of resistance for injection. So be careful with injecting. Make sure that you uh, push the push the inject date slowly. Okay, uh, I believe it's time for po po uh, question number two. The, the question is name the type of injection that you see on the screen. We are fifty percent people answered uh, who's who are here. So, if you guys want to take another couple of seconds to answer the question. Mm -hmm. All right. I'm gonna end the poll, and here are the results for you, Doctor Chan. Okay, uh, Daria, may, may I see the, the poll question for, for number two? I, I don't have access to the po uh, polls also. Uh, for the answer? Yeah, uh, poll number, three, question number two, the one that we're flashing right now, I'm getting the one um, from question direct, number one. Oh, okay, indirect out of plane approach, indirect in plane approach, direct in plane approach, and direct okay. out of plane approach. Yes, that's a direct, uh, direct and uh, in-plane approach. So when we say indirect, uh, for for the sake of discussion, we identify the area to be injected, but we perform a blind injection afterwards. So we just identify the area, okay? Uh, and th this is a direct in-plane approach on the long axis. So for the hip joint, usually uh, what was uh, being thought previously was to inject here at the recess, if you're somewhere near the, the femoral neck. But there's a problem um, that we, we encountered with that uh, approach. It's because there's a ligament here, we call that the zona orbicularis. So we, when we inject our injectate here, there's a blockage on this portion. That's not a problem for steroids. Steroids would have a systemic effect. So it could still address the, the bursitis if you're, or the hip joint pains if you're injecting in this area. However, if we use a regenerative uh, procedure such as P PRP and stem cell, that would be an issue because the PRP and stem cell would, would take to stay focused on one area. And that's a very important uh, advantage when using, uh, regen when using ultrasound. So usually we want to inject somewhere here, somewhere here above the neck of the femur and the femoral head uh, junction. Okay, so that's what you're going to do in this image. You see that the needle tip is here. I'm using a, a white box of interest for the, for the color flow to see where the needle is. This is a very deep injection. It's we're traversing a lot of muscles. We have to traverse the, uh, traverse the iliopsoas also. And then uh, you can see that uh, we're, we're injecting a few a few injectates to determine where the needle, needle tip is. And then there, you can see that the, the tip is in contact with the shaft and the, and the femoral head, and you could see the dilatation of the joint. So that's a good injection. Uh, 
All right, I think it's time for uh, poll question number three also. Yep, it is there. Okay. So what are the layers above and below the injection site? So this is the, the, the injection that you're going to be doing. Please tell me what are the layers above and uh, below the, the injection site. So usually we tend to poke the needle here in between two structures. So we'll wait for everyone's answer. So this, this is the quadriceps tendon. This is a short axis view. And then we have two layers of fat pad here. Um, please tell me, please tell me the, the names of the layers also. Uh, the, the first answer is quad, quadriceps pad and femoral fat pad. Uh, second one is hop and infrapatellar fat pad. Uh, third one is half and femoral fat pad. And the fourth one is super patellar recess and quadriceps fat pad. Wow, that was a lot of words, but uh, yeah, we, we have like, a lot of fat. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. Uh, we have about 50% people answer. So I'll give another five to 10 seconds um, and let you know uh, which one people are answering. All right, here are the results. Uh, we are 54% okay. for the fourth answer. Um, Suprapatellar recess and quadris, quadriceps fat pad. Yes, that's an that's a answer also. So we have to inject uh, the fat pad in between two, two layers also. So again, uh, when you play the video, here um, the, we are approaching almost uh, almost uh, perpendicular, so that the needle is almost parallel when we're injecting. And uh, we could see here it's traversing two fat pads here, and then we would see on this image there. Perfect. That's dilatation of the of the suprapatellar recess. So this goes. This has a, a connection directly to the knee joint. When you see the ballooning. Uh, it means that you're in the joint. And then we see the needle tip, we withdraw. Uh, this is a fairly simple uh, procedure for the knee joint. Usually this is one of the easiest to, to start with for, for beginners. So I highly recommend uh, doing, doing US guided procedures. Um, again, going back to the slide about the, the comparison between palpation and land, landmark, uh, palpation and US guided procedure uh, for the knee joint, the highest percentage is 79% for blind injection. So it's around eight out of 10 uh, patients that you would encounter. Usually you'd be able to inject the, the fluid uh, in inside the knee joint. However, if you compare this to 99% or almost a 100% uh, accuracy rate, you cannot sacrifice that uh, trade-off for the, for the patient. Any patient who, who, uh, who is informed of the percentages would definitely choose US guided uh, procedure. Now, this is a very special injection. Uh, this one's this one was uh, this this uh, photo is uh, what we call the knee extended tibia internally rotated position or exterior position. So this is what we use for posterior cruciate ligament injections. Uh, these are the sample cases that we see. So the the next slide would be. The, the video of one of the patients receiving the injections. Uh, this, is, this technique is invented by Dr. Jen Li Pan of uh, Taiwan. So he's the one who also, uh, who, who's also the owner of this photo. So the transducer, usually use a curvilinear transducer, we place it here. We internally rotate the tibia to move the tibial artery and nerve away from the injection site. So this uh, improves the layer of protection for the patient. Uh, that's very important because usually one of the main pitfalls with surgical interventions for PCL injections would be an injury of the neurovascular structures. So uh, this, this uh, position, the exterior position, helps uh, uh, provide injections with the better safety for the patients. Okay, so there um, you can see here, this, this is a PCL. We have the femur and the tibia over here, okay? And uh, you can see that the needle will be entering from lateral to lateral to medial. 
today. So there are needles entering from lateral to medial. Uh, this is a bit gamey. That's a part of the the gastrocnemius and hamstring muscle. So we have a lot of uh, layers to be in traverse. And here you can see that that's a posterior capsule. So that's also a an area with a lot of resistance. And you can see here on this area that the needle tip is, in, is uh, injecting the PRP into the site of injury. Okay. And then uh, the next the next indication the next use for for focus in knee injections would be the Baker cyst aspiration. This is a this is a long axis view of the of the cyst. So essentially, it's the same position earlier. Um, you can opt not to do the text here, but rather the conventional prone position for for injecting. I prefer to do an in-plane approach because I can see the needle tip. And uh, you can see here, this is a gauge 19 needle, never used uh, anything smaller than a gauge 19 needle for aspiration. Um, the fluid is usually viscous, so we encounter a lot of difficulty. You'll not be able to aspirate everything uh, with a smaller gauge. You can see here, the image suddenly turned, uh, turned dark. Usually when, the, when we're aspirating the cyst, the cyst collapses. So it's important to keep the hand steady that's, uh, that's momentary. And then here we could finish the aspiration. You can see that there's almost none uh, left. Uh, and usually this provides instantaneous relief for the, for the patient. Some would inject uh, steroids after the aspiration. That would also be done. Um, this has a direct connection to the knee joint. Again, this is not a true cyst, but rather synovial fluid um, going out of the semimembranosus uh, gastrocnemius bursa. So it has an access to the knee joint also. And then uh, this is an Achilles tendon uh, injection. So the patient's still lying prone. This is a short, short axis view of the Achilles tendon, but we're still be, we'll still be using an in-plane approach. You can see the hypoechoic areas there. That's my target. So you can see that the, the needle will move superiorly as we inject. So there, I'm moving the needle superiorly reach the areas of pathology and inject. Be careful with injecting uh, in, the, in the Achilles tendon. PRP is safe, but uh, make sure that the flow is small so as not to, to introduce a rupture also of the, of the tendon. So be careful with the, with the injection, particularly for tendons. We'll, I'm sure I, I see a lot of questions regarding the tendons. We'll, we'll uh, discuss that one later. When we end the when we end the lecture, okay. And then uh, I think this is my last slide. So this is for the anterior talofibular ligament. So you can see the bony uh, architecture of the lateral malleolus, and the, and here we will be injecting from distal to proximal. So we are injecting at the areas of the tear. Again, I'm using Doppler to make sure that uh, I can see the the needle at all times. This is a gauge 25 needle. Uh, the length is about 1.5 inches. So it's very hard to, to visualize this with the ultrasound. So I use the Doppler as a backup just in case the patient moves. This is a fairly uh, painful injection. So we have to, to use the Doppler also. And I believe that's, not, that's going to be my like, last slide. Marami uh, salamat po. Thank you. From the Philippines uh, again, I'm Dr. Mark Tan. The floor is open for uh, the Daria will help us with the QA. Thank you so much, Dr. Tan. Yes, we have quite a few um, questions, and if anyone still wants to uh, ask a question, please submit it in the QA box and we'll get to it. Um, so, the first question is What is your opinion on mixing lidocaine with steroid? Okay, um, the, the, my opinion here is that it's lidocaine actually that has the, the issues with injectates. It depolarizes the, the membrane, it affects the sodium and the potassium channels. So, and the lidocaine also has a cartilage breakdown effects. But uh, we need lidocaine for diffusion, so probably use rupivacaine instead for steroid injections. Uh, for regenerative procedures, we cannot use lidocaine as a local anesthetic. 
uh, that, that's very important because it will uh, decrease the effectivity of the regenerative uh, medicine. So that's very important. There's a huge difference when you're using the, when we are considering the type of injectate, if we have to use anesthesia. Uh, I usually use cold spray for the patient. So it's a to essentially a topical uh, anesthetic to partially, to temporarily numb the skin. Usually that the puncture point is the most important, the most painful point for, for injections. And then try to do the injection as uh, safe and fast as possible. Great, okay. thank you so much. Uh, next one, um, is there a gauge reference for the appropriate needle size based on location? Yes, uh, there is. Uh, that's a great question. For larger joints, usually it's gauge 21. So we're talking about the shoulder, talking about the, the knee and the, the hips. The echogenic uh, needle that I showed you, that's a special uh, needle from Payung. Uh, I'm not affiliated with the, uh, with the company, but that's a son the Sono MSK needle. So you can use a gauge 22 needle if that's the case, because the bevel is extra sharp for MSK uh, conditions. For smaller joints, uh, again, for the wrist, for the ankle, you should use a gauge 25 uh, needle. Uh, one thing you have to consider when using a smaller gauge, though, is that um, the injectate flow is slower. So it, uh, it delays the procedure time at the expense of a uh, patient comfort. So eventually, it will the, the effects will cancel out because the needle stays long in the body for, for a long time. But in general, for tendons, use at least a 23-gauge needle so that there's an easier flow, except for smaller areas like the, like the ankle, for the irritated fibular ligament, or for the TFCC, uh, use a 25-gauge uh, needle. Great, thank you. Um, what are your post-procedure advices to the patients um, as far as rest, joint, mobility, and return to play interval, et cetera? Okay, uh, it would depend. It would depend on the injection we did. Because usually if we did steroid injections, so we're talking about athletes, uh, usually they can play on after the, after the, uh, one day after the injection. So that would be helpful. But if you're talking about a regenerative procedure, Usually, I'd advise the, the patients, even for athletes, to take it easy for the next uh, three days. You can do activities of daily living. No, no, uh, no splints are necessary as of this point. Uh, what we saw in the studies are the splints. Uh, splints would cause uh, further injury. It would cause contractures and delay the rehabilitation. And then usually after three days, you can begin uh, physical therapy. For physical therapy, first two weeks would focus on the isometrics. Okay, uh, this is still the inflammatory phase, so a lot of joint movements would cause uh, pain and swelling. Um, and then week three and four, you should usually would be the concentric phase of rehabilitation, so you can see the range of motion exercises. So um, we can introduce that one as well as bands. And then week five and six usually would be the eccentric phase or the negative phase of muscle uh, contraction, usually that's where most of the injuries occur. That's the weakest point, and especially since that has the highest shear forces on the muscles and tendons, uh, followed by week seven and eight, which would be plyometrics, particularly in athletes. Uh, for the elderly, the approach is uh, uh, quite slower, so usually we don't reach the plyometrics phase anymore, and uh, Usually, they don't need the plyometric space. They need functional work. So it, it would really depend on the patient. It would depend on the needs of the patient. Thank you. Um, the next question is, what is your experience in fast jo joint injection? Mm -hmm. So for this is for QL. Is that correct? QL block. Uh, no, I did uh, leave it oh, down okay. to, to the end, yeah. but you can read yeah, that, but that would be nice. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So the, for facet joint injections, usually I, I opt for conservative management. Again, I'm a rehabilitation medicine uh, specialist. So this is something that I don't uh, routinely, routinely do. Usually the physical therapy uh, would help coupled with, with the pain medicine. So once the neural inflammation goes down, 
facet inject uh, facet joint uh, issues also subside. So I'd suggest still be patient. Give it at least one month of uh, therapy before you do the facet joint injections. Usually the the conservative measures work uh, work great. Okay. Do you want to mm -hmm. do the case? Um with the QR okay, so, code? Yeah. Uh, regarding the QR, uh, the question by, by Yong Suk uh, Yun, based on the QL block concept, I perform QL muscle injections in my clinic. I usually insert the needle perpendicularly towards the transverse process in lateral cubitus position, but there is also a transmuscular approach. So what type of approach is best for QL muscle injection? Uh, my opinion here would be the one you're doing right now, uh, the, 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 my opinion here would be to do it prone, like prone instead to the injections prone. Uh, this helps the patient uh, achieve more comfort also. And uh, you'll be able to, to have more leverage when, move, when moving the, the needle. So ergonomics is very important uh, when, we, when we inject. Thank you. Um, next one is, how do you maintain sterility? Wonderful question. So we didn't dis discuss about uh, sterility because of uh, the interest of time. Usually, uh, we use um, a sterile cover for the, for the ultrasound. That's number one. We clean the, the site of the, the injection. Uh, I use Qtacept for cleansing. Povidone iodine also works, uh, works great. And then we use a sterile gel for sterile gloves also. We use a sterile gel and gloves when we inject. Um, if there is no sterile gel available in, in your country, KY jelly would work well as, a, as an alternative. Some even use the Qtacept spray as an alternative also, particularly for smaller joints that works as well. So that's how we maintain sterility. And if you notice with the, with the injections, usually I inject about two centimeters away from the, one to two centimeters away from the, from the site. So as not to, not, not to have a lot of contact with the, with the gel. Okay. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. I think we covered passive joint injection uh, already. Yes. Um, yes. So I'll skip that. Um, what indicate do you usually use and what is the ratio? Injectates. Usually I use PRP or platelet rich uh, plasma rather than uh, steroids for injections. Again, I'd rather take the source of the symptom rather than the, the symptom itself. So there's no, there's no ratio. Uh, I don't use uh, anesthesia anymore for, for PRP. So it's a direct injection to the, to the area. But if you're asking about steroids and uh, the use of, of anesthesia, usually it's uh, one is to one. For the larger joints, one is to one would be a, a, a good number. Uh, we don't want a lot, of, uh, a lot of anesthesia going in the, in the body. It could have interactions also with the heart, particularly for the elderly. So that's something to consider. Uh, maybe do a 20%, 80% ratio when you're talking about uh, trigger finger injections. So just minimal anesthesia for, for the patient and uh, more of a pure, pure steroid injection. Great. Uh, next one is, do you have any slides showing nerve bundles? I always have a hard time spotting the nerve bundle. Okay. Or maybe oh, you have tips. Nerve bundle. <laughs> um, yeah. For the nerve bundle, usually they would look like a, it's a honeycomb, uh, it's a honeycomb uh, appearance. I believe I have one of the one of those here um, in my slides. Uh, I hope the the slides are still can be seen in the background. Yes. Mm -hmm. We can see it there. So this is the honeycomb appearance of the nerve. Another way to to determine if this is really the nerve is to trace the nerve proximally. You would see the nerve starting to uh, enter the muscles, so trace it slowly. That's the best way to be sure that that's the nerve. And another thing would be, would be to move the tendons, to move the tendons, do a dynamic maneuver. Usually the tendons um, are subjected to an, an isotropy. 
So the bright areas here would turn black when there's movement, but you would not see a lot of changes with the characteristic of the nerve. So that's one of the ways to identify the, the nerve bundle. It's one of the best tips that I can share with you. Great. And the last mm -hmm. question is, have you had uh, much practice with 3D slash 4D ultrasound? Is there a main reason why this technology isn't used universally? Uh, 3D and 4D you, you, ultrasound, uh, I don't have an experience when it comes to US guided injections. This is more of a, more of a forming an image, a better image. So right now the the 2D image for for shoulder injuries, particularly shoulder tendons, is already comparable to the MRI. Maybe that's why they, they're not developing the, the technology. And usually uh, the ultrasound is also very sensitive to to interstitial tears. So we like to use to correlate that one with the MRI. Sometimes we miss out on interstitial tears, particularly for the Achilles tendon uh, and also the supraspinatus tendon. Interstitial tears are tears that you can't see even with arthroscopy. So that's important to note it's inside the tendon. So ultrasound helps in that regard. Uh, and I believe that's uh, the reason why we don't use the 3D, 4D, Slibera D, but the, that's something that we should be, we should be uh, studying going forward. Thank you. One more last question. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, what should be the probe angle for the out-of-plane injection? Probe angle for out-of-plane injection would still be, uh, it's straight. It's the needle that, that changes. It depends on how, how deep you would go. Usually for superficial structures, it's going to be around uh, 2 cm two cm deep uh, and then so on and so forth. So it's ad adjusting the trajectory of the, of the needle rather than the probe. Uh, when we do the injections, we have to remember not to move the probe when you're injecting. You'll never be able to see the, the needle that way. Um, another tip is if you could uh, do the in-plane approach, it would be better than the out-of-plane uh, approach. Again, out-of-plane would require more practice. Uh, and uh, there's the issue of visualizing the, the shaft instead of the tip, particularly if the if the needle is uh, sideways, for example, this is a probe, then this would be the, the needle. And it's uh, it's angled at a 45 degree angle. There's a huge chance that you, you might miss the, the tip and see the shaft instead. And uh, we will not be injecting the, the uh, area that's targeted. This is particularly important for regenerative medicine procedures. Um, again, they, they will not have any systemic effects. So where you inject after three to five minutes, that's where the, the injectate will stay. All right, I think we're at time and I don't see any more uh, additional questions. So really appreciate you taking the time today, Dr. Tan, uh, to cover this wonderful topic. I think it's very specific and you had so many really great examples that uh, people can apply it in daily um, routines uh, at their jobs. So thank you so much, uh, everyone, for joining us today. And we hope to see you uh, in our next webinar, uh, which will share the information in the post email. Uh, and then you will receive the recording as well of this webinar. Um, and then it will be posted as well on the website. And also wanted to remind everyone that we'll have Focus World happening in September, uh, where we'll have about 45 different presentations um, that will be different topics. Um, MSK as well will be covered. Uh, so we hope to see you there as well. Thank you so much again, Dr. Ten. We hope to see you soon um, and have a great day. <laughs> Thank, thank you, Daria and the Focus Academy for, for this lecture. Looking, looking forward to the next to attending the next lectures. Great. And thank, thank you, you everyone for taking the time to, to attend also. Thank you. Have a good night.